Welcome. Uh, good evening and hello, everyone. Uh, delighted to be joined by so many of you. In fact, lots of people still joining, but a good time to get this off to a start. I'm Jacob Reynolds. I'm an associate fellow of the Academy of Ideas, as well as the head of policy for the Brussels-based think tank MCC Brussels. We're really delighted to have this uh, opportunity to carry on what for us has been uh, a very important uh, discussion. And this Battle of Ideas Festival satellite event is uh, just the continuation of a conversation. Some of you might have been with us over the weekend for the Battle of Ideas Festival proper in London. If you were, thank you. I hope you had a good time. Um, and if you were or if you're not, please note that the discussion uh, both will be tackling this topic, but also a whole variety of other Battle of Ideas festival style topics. We'll be carrying that on in Buxton on the 25th of November. So please do, one of my colleagues will hopefully put a link for tickets in the chat. Do get your tickets to what I keep referring to as free speech in the peaks. Um, and it's a really wonderful event. And if you, it could even be your first Battle of Ideas event. So uh, if, if so, we'd be delighted to have you. Um, of course, you can su support our work if you end up enjoying this discussion or think that more discussions like this should be had. You can carry that on by uh, firstly by subscribing to our Substack, ideally as a, uh, a paid subscriber if you want to really support our work and generally sharing and supporting what we do on social media. Um, but I, as I said, we started this discussion at the Battle of Ideas Festival proper, but this issue uh, we decided is something that needs a lot more attention than what we were able to give it at the festival. Indeed, uh, only today we have news of uh, graffiti on a Holocaust uh, memorial library in central London, which sadly, I think, falls into something of a pattern. Since the terror attacks of early October on Israel by Hamas, uh, there's been a chain of anti-Semitic incidents right across uh, London and right across Europe. Now, certainly there are many uh, pro-Palestine protesters who want to voice their criticism of Israel. And the scale of Israel's military campaign in Gaza means that these voices and these uh, anti-Israel sentiment is only going to get louder. And not every, or maybe not even most, criticisms of Israel are uh, automatically or themselves anti-Semitic. But it does seem to me to be delusional to suggest that anti-Semitism is a problem just confined to the margins of society. So this evening, we want to try and get to grips with what's going on. And especially uh, if you took a look at the event blurb that we had on the website, especially grapple with three kind of related sets of questions. The first is that uh, many might complain that criticisms of Israel is being shut down by the complaint of anti-Semitism. So how do we recognize genuine anti-Semitism that exists without kind of weaponizing the term anti-Semitism and shutting down all criticism of Israel? Then secondly, what explains the increasingly open expression of anti-Semitism anti uh, on the streets of London and other Western countries? Various uh, suggestions have been put forward uh, all from everything to do with the transformation of left-wing politics uh, right through to uh, problems to do with integration and multiculturalism. And thirdly, how do we or how should we respond to this resurgence of anti-Semitism? Should, uh, some people have suggested banning pro-Palestine uh, protests because of their pro-Hamas content. Um, some people think politicians should just be more forthright in condemning this sentiment. Um, and generally speaking, how do we demonstrate courage uh, in the face of this threat and offer solidarity with uh, Jewish people uh, across Europe and across the world? To help us uh, get into this discussion, we've got a really wonderful uh panel who will speak in Battle of Ideas Festival style briefly, um, but uh, succinctly and compellingly. So I'll give them five or six minutes for their opening introductions. I'd like to um, I'd like to introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. So firstly, we've got Daniel Ben-Ami. Uh, Daniel, who I'm sticking up on the screen for you now. Uh, Daniel is a journalist. He's the creator of a very important website called The Radicalism of Fools, which is a website dedicated and has been dedicated for some time now to rethinking anti-Semitism in its modern uh, forms. He's also the author of two great books on economics called Ferraris for All in Defense of Economic Progress and Cowardly Capitalism. So I'm delighted that Daniel's going to be joining us. We're also very lucky to be welcomed by Laura Dodsworth. 
Laura Dodsworth um, is a writer and a photographer. She's a first off author of um, some great books, which have been hugely influential among many Battle of Ideas Festival attendees from one Free Your Mind to the other Maurice One State of Fear. Um, uh, but for our discussion tonight, very importantly, Laura was one of the main uh, conveners of the October Declaration, which I already saw some people posting about in the chat, which was an important intervention in the public uh, discussion in uh, Britain and elsewhere, uh, taking a kind of firm stand on, the, on against the resurgence of anti-Semitism and noting that it's a serious problem. And then speaking third, we got Sabina uh, Bethesbal. Sabina is the chair of the Berlin-based Freiblick Institute. Uh, she's uh, author, also the author of Off Center, How Party Consensus Undermines Our Democracy, and is, and many of you might have read some of her writing as the Germany correspondent for Spiked. So we've got three great speakers to help us uh, introduce this discussion, but then in kind of classic Battle of Ideas festival style, things do not end there. We'll be looking to come right out to the audience for questions, comment, and discussion. We've got a lot of people on the call. I hope everybody that wants to have their voice heard has an opportunity to. And when we come out to questions, people will have, a, a, a as I said, an opportunity to join the discussion. So to kick us off, uh, Daniel, can I ask you for some opening thoughts? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jacob. And thanks for the soothing Hebrew music at the beginning. I thought I was hallucinating, but uh, evidently not. So I wanted to start by quoting someone I think you should take very, very seriously. Uh, this person is Ghazi Hamad, who's a senior official in Hamas, the Islamist terrorist group. And just to quote him from a few days ago, we, were, we will repeat the October the 7th attack time and again until Israel is eliminated. We are victims. Everything we do is justified. That's what he said. So from his perspective, everything is justified. You know, murder, rape, lying, and of course the mass killing of Jews is justified from his perspective. That is, that is what Hamas is about. But listen to the quote again, particularly the second part of the quote. We are victims. Everything we do is justified. You know, that kind of pers uh, perspective doesn't come from the Quran or some other Islamic holy text like the Hadith. That is a kind of outlook that is very common, for example, in Western universities, from people quoting not the Prophet Muhammad, but quoting or at least claiming to represent Michel Foucault or Franz Fanon, these kind of Western thinkers, that they've got this kind of victim-centered mentality. So it's the mentality behind the uh, decolonize the curriculum, you know, uh, get rid of the uh, kind of old white men, the kind of key Western influences on, on Western universities, uh, tear down statues of anyone you don't like. It's the same kind of mentality. I mean, at Western universities, they don't yet have automatic weapons and power gliders, uh, at least not yet, maybe in the future, but it's very much the same kind of mentality. And I think what this kind of vignette tells us is, yes, Islamism is a problem, but there's a lot of overlap between that and Western identity politics. And in the West, although the two merge together, that Western identity politics, you know, the kind of elite view that we are the victims, we are speaking on behalf of the victims, we need to purge everything about Western civilization and modernity, that is very, very strong. How does Israel and anti-Semitism come into this? Well, if you kind of elevate the Palestinians as a kind of the central element of pity in the world, which is the way they look at it, and not an enviable position for the Palestinians to be in either. The flip side of that is that Israel is the epitome of evil. So when they talk about Israel, they talk about it being the epitome of racism, the epitome of fascism, equivalent to the Nazis. Uh, they even talk about it in terms of, uh, if you there's even a discussion, for example, about climate justice, how Israel is the kind of epitome of bad when it comes to climate justice. Or Israel, I'm not making this up. You can read this discussion on uh, Western anti-Israel activists. Or Israel is the epitome of treating disabled people badly. It upholds the right to maim, as a, a prominent Western uh, academic puts it. He's, her book is discussed in, at Princeton University. So if you believe that we, the kind of Western elites, are the victims, and we have to look at things from the perspective of the victims, then it's a very short step to uphold Israel as the epitome of evil. You know, the, the, as the Iranian regime calls it, the little Satan, as opposed to America and the West more generally, 
which is the great Satan. So maybe really just to conclude and to answer one of your questions, Jacob, I think if people criticize the real live Israel, I think that's fine. You know, flesh and blood Israel, which like every country in the world does have faults and we can discuss it, its faults. But generally speaking, this discussion, this anti-Israel discussion, they're not discussing the real live Israel. They're discussing Israel as the epitome of evil, Nazi, fascist, colonial, colonialist Israel. Uh, and that, I would contend, that kind of view is very clearly anti-Semitic. Great. Thanks a lot, Daniel. It was uh, very succinct opening remarks, and it's nice, and hopefully we'll get a chance to develop things further in the discussion. But uh, Laura, over to you, some opening thoughts. You're on mute, Laura. Um, no worries. Sorry, sorry. And um, considering I'm a lot less qualified to talk about this, I seem to have quite a lot to say. So... <laughs> Um, I know many people here at the Academy of Ideas have been warning about the rise of anti-Semitism for years, but I was completely unaware of it. And I woke up to it on 7th of October. Before the people of Israel had, had a chance to count the bodies, um, there were people celebrating mass murder in the streets here in this country and around the world. And they were shouting death to Israel and gas the Jews. And I was shocked myself, uh, sickened and really ashamed that this happened in our country. And I was struck by a big difference between this and the Russia-Ukraine war. Now, I know there are lots of differences, but one thing that happened then is when people protested and, and marched in solidarity for the Ukraine, they didn't say death to Russia or reopen the Gulag Archipelago and let's kill all Russians. And that's because it's not the same. There's something very different about the criticism and the hatred that Jews and Israel are targeted with. We also haven't had marches directed at Saudi Arabia for um, bombing Yemenis. And there are no big protests about the concentration camps for Uyghurs in China because it's different for Jews in Israel. I think that anti-Semitism has transmogrified into Israelophobia and criticism of Israel, which Jake Wallace Simons um, sets out really well in his book, Israelophobia. So Jacob asked me in my few minutes to consider um, whether criticism of Israel's action is being shut down by anti-Semitism. But I'd rather come at this a different way and flip it around. I think that criticism of Israel's actions is anti-Semitism. Um, first of all, we can't really talk about this unless we acknowledge how serious anti-Semitism is right now for Jews. So the, since the 7th of October, there have been nearly 900 anti-Semitic crimes and incidents reported. That's bound to be an underreporting, and it's the biggest number in a 25-day period since 1984. Um, you can read examples of them on the Community Security Trust website. Here's a few. Um, in Manchester, two men were walking towards a woman wearing a Star of David and they shouted, gas, gas. Um, at a London train station, a man approached a Jewish girl and said, I hope you and all your people die in the war and Allah will do the right thing and end you. Now, none of the incidents on the CST website differentiate between the state of Israel and Jews. Um, the Auschwitz Memorial announced on Twitter they lost over second 6,000 followers. Um, I myself have lost a, a load of Subsac subscribers and followers too. It's been extremely unpopular to be anti-anti-Semitism and pro-British Jews. Who'd have thought? I didn't know. Um, a video recently circulated of um, protesters at Harvard University cornering a group of Jews and shouting shame, shame in their faces. This wasn't the Israeli ambassador, it wasn't an Israeli general, it wasn't anybody from, from their government. These are ordinary Jews. These historical protests aren't anti-Israel, they're anti-Semitic. I just wanted to make that really clear. That's the angle that I'm coming at this from. Um, I mean, there's further madness. Sisters, Sisters Uncut, which is a supposed feminist organization, organized a pro-Palestine flash mob at Liverpool Street Station. And we have that means we now have women feminists, supposedly, in this country, cheering for a side that rapes, deliberately kills babies and children, and cut open the stomach of a pregnant woman and stabbed the fetus. What sort of tre treacherous, short-sighted idiots 
cheer on those monsters. Student unions shared cartoons of paragliders. So the sort of people who normally obsess over hate speech couldn't condemn acts of hate. And the sorts of people who are obsessed with safe spaces didn't care about how safe Jews felt at the universities. Everyone who believed that Israel bombed a hospital was peculiarly gullible when they chose to believe a terrorist organization that burns babies rather than waiting for intelligence or believing the IDF. So if people aren't anti-Semitic, then they are simpletons at best. And there's also something very cowardly about it. The people that are marching are doing this on the safety of our streets and from the comfy armchairs in academia. It's a really um, repellent notion, actually. So what's fed all of this is something I think others here will be much better qualified than me to talk about, but it appears to be the very dangerous infiltration of dangerous ideology. Um, open expression of anti-Semitism and anti-Israel feeling is obviously because people are differentiating between the oppressor and the oppressed. And for them, it seems better to side with the oppressed as they see it, even though they're terrorists. They'd rather side with the terrorists than the terrorised. That's collectivist thinking. It's tribal thinking. And the big danger with it is that it lets individuals off the hook. It lets individual terrorists off the hook. So, for instance, um, somebody who's been very upset with my pro-Israel stance said to me, the terrorists aren't to blame. No. Um, Hamas and Mossad funded the terrorists. And so Hamas and, sorry, the CIA and Mossad funded the terrorists. So they're to blame. But, you know, you're really morally lost when you assert that somebody who killed a baby is not responsible for killing the baby. So it also means that as well as the individual terrorists being let off the hook, all of that anti-Semitic and stupid thinking is left off the hook. So how do we respond to the resurgence of anti-Semitism on the streets? I think this is really difficult. I mean, I have found the protests incredibly distasteful, profoundly misguided. And it seems to me that some things that are happening are, are illegal, but I do believe in free speech and the right of people to protest. Um, the Public Order Act makes it a crime to incite violence against another person, and the Terrorism Act requires prosecutors to show that somebody was trying to um, commit or instigate acts of terrorism. There are objective tests which need to be fulfilled, but arguably even waving a Palestinian flag after a terrorist attack on civilians is objectively not just to show support for Palestine, but to show support for Hamas. The big problem is the police are not policing without fear or favour. You know, we've seen lots of examples of mm. police now pulling down hostage posters, arresting people with union jacks and... Um, well, just allowing people to shout jihad, which, regardless of the multiple meanings we're told it has, normally means holy war. Laura, can I ask you to come why, to the conclusion? Yeah, OK. Well, why are they doing that? I mean, I, I think what's very simple is the police are taking a decision operationally not to arrest because it would be, frankly, completely incendiary. So the problem is far bigger than the specific protests and the spillover anti-Semitism on the street. The problem is that operationally, it would be incendiary to do anything about it. People have called Hamas a death cult, and it is. It's not just the horrible deaths they've caused and the fact they want all Jews dead. It's a death cult that's now infected our country and our culture. I think it's where we are after decades of dumbing down, manipulation, being too comfortable and forgetting what's made us great but it's not enough to reject what we dislike you can't just you can't just reject the protests and everything they stand for i think the problem is that people have to love something more than what they want to reject so okay. i think that oh, oh, one more sentence that um among the things you asked us to consider i i think that the most important the most important thing is missing which is how you resurrect a love of british culture so that you can reject this dangerous ideology great thanks a lot uh, laura um a nice few things to open with and again we'll dig out lots of that in the discussion uh, sabina if i can come over to you yep okay so i i think i don't need to maybe repeat that we've had um a, a terrible outburst of anti-semitism in this country too the speed and scale of all this has shocked many um one of the worst things has been the firebombing of a uh, of a synagogue 
um, but also calls to wipe Israel off the map uh, and, and so on and so forth. And I think this can only be explained by several poisonous trends, um, none of them completely new, having merged, coming together. One of these trends is, of course, Muslim anti-Semitism, which has been supported and encouraged by what I would call the anti-Semitism of the German cultural left. They are united in their hatred for Israel, their depiction of the Palestinians as the true victims. Um, Daniel uh, mentioned that. They look at Hamas as freedom fighters. They need each other for uh, legitimacy, both sides. But there is another trend which I want to focus on here tonight, and I, I want to really highlight. And I think that trend, again, not new, I would call it cowardice. <laughs> the cowardice of people within our society, who wield a certain amount of influence, who should be at the forefront of the fight against anti-Semitism, but um, who seem to be, uh, as uh, the stronger anti-Semitism gets, the more they, are, they, they seem to be um, obsessed with trying to contain the conflict which we've seen erupting uh, on our streets and keeping a lid on whatever tensions we have. So um, to... to explain to you what I mean. I can give you some concrete examples. One of the examples was last Friday um, at um, at the UN when um, our foreign minister um, rejected a UN resolution brought in by Jordan calling for a truce in Gaza. It was a resolution clearly intended to criticize Israel's need and right to defend itself. Um, and um, Germany abstained. Um, the Israeli ambassador later said, all the talk of Germany standing by Israel, making Israel's right to exist, its own raison d'etre, sounded terribly hollow because this was one time when Germany could show that it was really standing by Israel and it didn't. And I do agree with those critics from within Germany who say the reason why Germany did this was more for domestic reasons, uh, to appease opposition within our own country, to keep the lid on the protests, as I say. The second example I have are our public broadcast, our state media. So as the conflict continues, we see them um, openly criticizing Israel. We had yesterday an interview with a, 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 a functionary from a Muslim organization. Um, he's been rightly criticized for a long time for never having condemned in a clear and unambiguous way October 7th massacres, and he was meant to justify himself on television, but the whole interview went badly wrong. It became an indictment of anti-Muslim racism within German society, and in the end, he got away with saying that Israel was committing war crimes, and our journal the journalist who was interviewing him was either too inexperienced or, again, uh, too cowardly to actually challenge him on this. The third example I have, and that might answer one of your questions, Jacob, is the question of banning protests. Um, Germany has banned a number of protests. I think that's also part of the cowardice. Um, they've banned um, Palestinian pro-Palestinian demonstrations, some of them, but they've also banned demonstrations against Hamas. So we have a fairly well-known activist here in Berlin organized what I think is actually quite a nice uh, action. He was going to go with a number of cars through Berlin, Neukölln, which is the area where we've had most of the um, anti-Semitic outbursts, um, showing placards of some of the hostages, um, answering people's questions like, how much money does the EU send to, to Palestinian areas uh, each year? And also um, displaying um, uh, demands such as free Gaza from Hamas. Now, this protest wasn't banned, outrightly banned, but the police told him they could not protect him, they could not protect the cars, so in the end, it had to be called off. Um, this is not only, I find, an attack on free speech, but it also bears a very clear message, which is that the fear of retaliation of an anti-Israeli mob is enough to stop the opposition. Um, We've also had police taking down posters or photos of Hamas hostages and so on and so forth. And I want to end by saying I think that this cowardice is actually one of the main problems we're facing at the moment. And anybody who talks, any serious historian or analyst who talks of, of the situation in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s when we had outbursts of anti-Semitism, as we all know, um, and it's not just Hannah Arendt who says this, anybody who analyzes that situation says the problem was not so much 
the raving anti-Semites, they were a big problem. The problem was liberal, left, mainstream society, which was too cowardly, too unable to, to oppose this. And I find this chilling to see that we might be repeating that mistake. Yeah, it's very much so. Thanks, Sabina. That was, again, some great opening remarks. So lots on the table to discuss. And uh, as I say, where there's lots of you on the call, so we want to try and allow for as many people to voice their opinions. You may also, of course, because uh, you might disagree with some of the sentiments raised, but use the raise hand function and we'll uh, get to you and we'll bring the panel in uh, periodically to uh, respond and make some further points. So uh, Toby, Toby Marshall. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, brilliant. Uh, thank you for the introductions. Um, they, they, they were excellent. Um, uh, so um, Britain has a population of 67 million people. Um, it has a Muslim population of uh, 3.9 million. Um, and it has a Jewish population of approximately 270,000. So my question to the um, panel is just looking at the British dimension of this question as opposed to the Israeli-Palestinian dimension of this question. Um, how do we move forward? Um, so one of the things that's raised, I think, with some legitimacy is Muslim, Muslim anti-Semitism. Um, and there was a very interesting report the Henry Jackson Institute reported in 2020 on Muslim anti-Semitism. Um, and that was kind of widely reported. It made the point that... Um, it detected um, anti-Semitic attitudes um, amongst 50% of the Muslim population in general, but that dropped to 12% amongst Muslims that were socially integrated. Uh, and it found a higher proportion amongst university educated um, Muslims, a higher proportion of what it considered to be anti-Semitic attitudes. So I, I'm just interested in what you think. Uh, I'm a teacher, I teach many Muslim students. Um, what it is you think what arguments, maybe not teachers, I don't think teachers should be political and indoctrinate, but what ad, what arguments British adults should be having um, to challenge anti-Semitism um, in, in this country? And I, I just put a question to you, and the question is this, do you think it requires a Muslim um, to express positive attitudes about Israel to be to count as, uh, to be able to count themselves as anti-Semitic? Because obviously, Muslim sympathies in terms of the international conflict are with Palestinians, right? not, not as a monolithic bloc. Um, Muslims, as I encounter them, actually have a spread of different opinions on this. Um, but the general tendency will be to be sympathetic with the Palestinians as opposed to yeah. the Israel, Israelis. So, so just your take on how we move forward. Great. Thanks a lot, Toby. Uh, next up is Tim, Tim Scott. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, Tim Scott. Uh... I do a bit of work for the Freedom Association and um, thanks to Academy of Ideas for another great battle. Um, two points, which I'll, I'll try to fashion into a question. Um, one is, um, can we all agree that it's not necessarily anti-Semitic to criticise Israel and the government of Israel? However, um, when the Middle East's only democracy with equality for women and tolerance of homosexuality, etc., is repeatedly singled out for criticism, um, then you have to start wondering, well, what else is going on? And I would just refer people to um, a, a situation not a million miles from Israel, and that is the Turkish occupation of northern Cyprus. Now, we, we hear hardly anything about Turkish in, in, in inverted commas, Turkish occupied northern Cyprus. Now, uh, why is that? And, and what's going on here. So I think you have to ask some of the deeper questions here um, off, off the back of that comment that that uh, is not necessarily anti-Semitic, but, but, but when Israel is picked out time and time again by people and by, by certain UN forums, one of which is being chaired by Iran at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. you do have to, you, you do have to um, question that. And th th I've just noticed, just to finish, I've just noticed there's quite a few comments about the policing I think London seems to, I, uh, the police seem to have lost, certainly in London, the police seem to have lost control. Uh, I've, I've long thought the government should take policing off the London mayor uh, and have it report into the Home Secretary. Uh, are we being fairly and evenly policed at the moment? I, I'm not convinced we are. And uh, okay. the police always seem to go for the easy, 
the uh, the easy option, and uh, they seem uh, the police in London at least seem to be in retreat and unwilling to enforce the law. Okay, thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, okay, next up, someone who doesn't have the camera on, someone who's going by, who obviously was in charge of a previous meeting, but not this one. So, admin, whoever's signed on as admin. No, maybe we can't hear you. You are unmuted yourself. Maybe it's a problem. Are you coming in? Oh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Hello. We can't hear you, I'm afraid. Okay, hold it there a second. We'll try and come back to you in a second. Okay. Uh, Ian Fitzsimmons. Hi. Uh, yeah. I, to me, it's a little bit more confusing or a little bit more in-depth than that. I'm, I'm an old man from Hackney, growing up in Hackney, which people might know is a very Jewish area of London, especially the part that I grew up in. And I grew up amongst anti-Semitism. Uh, so it predates identity politics, it predates all of the stuff. Uh, and even though some of the most positive influences in my life were Jews, I was prone to coming out with anti-Semitic nonsense. So it really is a case of uh, things don't seem to have changed that much for me. Things don't seem to have changed, but I'm, I'm a lot more old and mature now. I was having a bit of breakfast in the cafe in Brighton the other week discussing the, the stuff that happens, uh, and I was arguing with a woman who said, beheading Jews doesn't matter because... The, the big picture is you've got a free Palestine, you've got to do... So this dreadful narrative of it's okay to behead Jews is something that sort of reminded me of growing up in the 70s in Hackney, where there was just this real genuine hatred of Jews. They're like a genuine real thing that, even though, you know, growing up amongst Jewish people and all the rest of it, it was an accepted form of racism that people didn't see as racism so to me of course we can all accept the, the, the new identity politics we can all dissect that and agree with it but some you know that the early speaker mentioned about british culture how can we change it to me it's endemic in british culture that is a there's a strain of anti-semitism that's so acceptable that you can just talk about well it doesn't really matter because they're only jews and again it's like how do we pass that you know, how do we actually physically and uh, intellectually get past that thing of, you know, there's just this general acceptance of all the Roman Jews. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, useful, useful challenge. How new is some of this? Can we try and come back to admin, whoever you are? I can't see you very well either. No. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Great. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. I just wanted to start off by saying I've got a long history of being anti-racist, and that includes anti-Semitism. You know, I'm against anti-Semitism and so on. So I don't have a problem with any of that. Right. But what I find really, it's it's very strange. I mean, I'm just going to say that, I mean, I've been out of politics for a few years, but few, but it wasn't very long ago when people like Daniel and Claire up there and even Frank would sit on a platform. We used to go on a demo, pro-Palestinian demo, we used to organize go pro-Palestinian demos in support of Palestinian people. And the kind of things we argued then was self-determination for Palestinian people. I have not heard such words from Daniel yet. He's obviously forgotten. Do Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? All we hear is about Israel has a right to defend themselves, right? And we used to argue, and they used to argue then, and I believed it because Daniel's himself argued it, as well as Frank, right, that the biggest recruiting sergeant for anti-Semitism in European countries is the oppressive act of the Israeli government, right? They used to argue it, but today they seem to have got amnesia or done a 180 degree turn, which I was very shocked by when I came to uh, the conference over the weekend. I, unfortunately, I raised my hand every session, couldn't, couldn't get a chance to, uh, to kind of speak. But I think it's, it's very interesting that different speakers the level of debate is so poor that they quote an incident of 
something that happened to a synagogue here, and I'm completely opposed to all of that, right? Don't get me wrong. Similarly, you can find incidents that are going on in Israel where, pa where Palestinian Arabs are being killed, booted out, 750,000 being dispossessed. I mean, you can come up with a lot of similar kind of incidents, but that doesn't make it a, a political analysis of what is going on. And if all you guys can see is what's what's a problem with Israel and what Israel's facing, but you're completely blind to what the Palestinians have been facing for a long time, 50, 70 years, then it's a big problem. I mean, when I went to the session at the uh, at the weekend for the three speakers who are pro-Israeli speakers, the whole problem seems to have started on the 7th of o o October. Before that, nothing. There was no problem. They're probably sitting on their hands in libraries, reading nice books. But the Palestinians will be getting smashed for a long time. And for them not to be able to recognize that. And and I cannot remember the last time Daniel got worked up about the the problems that the Palestinians are facing. I mean, it is. I was very shocked that people who considered to be fellow travelers, you know, and we are we went to Palestinian demos, we argued against, you know, with people for the rights of Palestinians for self determination. That those people today are almost it's as if they're they're speaking for the Israeli government. Total absence yeah. of any kind of materialist analysis. It's very, it's a shame that I to to hear ex colleagues who've changed so much in such a short space of time. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll have a chance to get back to that, I'm sure. The last one I'll take, I'll take David Axe, and then we'll get the panel in. So, David. Sorry. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. So, yeah, so David Axe from uh, Your Fight is Our Fight. So, um, uh, uh, I think it's very important that, obviously, engaging in the battle of ideas, um, uh, tackling... Uh, anti, that we tackle anti-Semitism by you know, tackling this this crude and, and and kind of simplistic binary that uh, you know, Palestine Palestinians are the oppressed and Israel is the is the oppressor, which I think we've just heard. Um, uh, but then also I think we need to be uh, showing our solidarity with uh, with Jews in Britain who must be absolutely scared out of their uh, out of their wits uh, by this absolutely um, uh, grotesque and, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, kind of exponential growth in, uh, you know, anti-Semitic incidents and attacks. I mean, near to where I lived, um, I, you know, I kind of I walked, I walked past it, not realizing what was going on. This is on the, on, uh, on October the, on October the 7th or kind of the early hours of October the 8th. And, um, uh, and there were people out on the, out on the out on the streets, and I was just couldn't work out what the hell was what the hell was going on. And retrospectively, and I understand that they were out whilst the bodies were still warm, uh, celebrating Hamas's pogrom. Um, there's obviously a major problem here. Uh, we need to um, uh, tackle the basis of anti-Semitism. I absolutely agree with what uh, Laura and Daniel and, and Sabina have, have argued that this is kind of founded on um, this kind of Israelophobia. Uh, the kind of this idea that Israel is somehow the kind of the, you know, an exception, um, and um, uh, but also I think uh, as you know, Laura has, show, has kind of shown the way. We need, we need to show show our solidarity with uh, with Jews in Britain. All right, thanks a lot, David. Uh, okay, so some responses from the panel. Uh, Laura, do you, do you want to kick off? Just pick up on a couple of things, and we'll go straight out for more for more in a second. Sorry, you you you're you're on mute. I was I was terrified of this happening to me because it's been so long since I've done a Zoom call that I was I was so, certain. Sorry, sorry, I'm I'm, su I'm such an idiot. Okay, well to pick up on something Sabine said, she talked about cowardice. I had got something in my opening statements, but I was going over too long. I think cowardice is really important to tackle, and it ties into what David's saying about everyone showing solidarity. Um, there's something about. <laughs> about the Labour response, which has been particularly cowardly. Now, I can tell you this is one of the conveners of the October Declaration. I won't mention any names. There are a few people in Labour who liked the look of the October Declaration but wouldn't sign it because we didn't make enough concession to being supportive of the Palestinians' plight. And actually, we did talk about the tragic deaths of Palestinians 
in two places in the declaration, but it was not an exercise in both sides and because it wasn't supposed to be. And I thought it was really disappointing, to be honest, that Labour MPs couldn't stay, take a strong stand in support of British Jews and opposing anti-Semitism because they were upset about, they were worried about upsetting their Muslim constituents. It reminded me a little bit of Keir Starmer kneeling for Black Lives Matters because it was looked like the popular thing to do, the popular thing to signal, even though they argue for defunding the police and the disruption of the Western nuclear family. Um, I've written down red pilled. I can't remember what that was in relation to, but I think that one problem at the moment is people are very, very red pilled by um, events of recent years. It probably goes back further, but particularly with COVID, people have totally lost trust with authorities. It might be one reason why people think that terrorists aren't to blame, but the CIA who supposedly funded them. They're constantly reaching for different sorts of meanings to justify what happens in the world. And I do need to pick up on the last point of admin about being blind to the Palestinians. I don't think you contextualise the sort of terrorism that happened on the 7th of October. I'm afraid that killing babies is not self-defence. The terrorists weren't attacking military bases. They broke into people's homes. They tied them up. They tortured them in front of their own families. They killed them and they desecrated the corpses. It is not self-defense, which is why when you're talking about October the 7th, you do not need to contextualize it. And if you are going to contextualize it, there's a very long period of history, not just the last 75 years. Great. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Sabina, some thoughts? Yeah, I thought the I thought the question about Muslims, um, I think Toby was interesting, and I think it's it's a it's a huge big issue also um, in Germany how to deal with um, Muslim anti-Semitism in schools, and I think this is also where the cowardice comes in, which I think isn't new because one of the reasons why we are where we are at, I can certainly speak for Germany, is because this type of anti-Semitism hasn't been cha challenged or wasn't challenged in the last years for fear of populism, for fear of being um, of sounding um, anti-Muslim. Anti and I think that's why I'm, I'm so worried about it because I think we're, we're challenging much, much more than we think. So there's also a whole load of ideology behind this, the ideology of multiculturalism, for example, that you're not, um, which was only seen as completely positive and you were, and, and, and you were never allowed to, 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 to mention any problems involved with that. And this has led, um, and this has basically encouraged the kind of thing we're seeing at the moment. And what we're seeing is, is, as I said, not new at all. So a couple of years ago, or for many years now, certainly since nineteen, uh, since two thousand fifteen or so, um, Jews have been warned in Germany to not, for example, wear their kippahs in every single place. So when they go to certain areas. Um, uh, ghettos, um, um, certain ghetto areas, they were told to be very, very careful. So this is, um, so So I think we really, up, up, we really need to challenge much, much more than just that one form of anti-Semitism, but the, the entire ideology behind it. And I think, I do think schools play a big role, but I do also think that teachers have been left pretty much alone with this, um, particularly because of that whole ideology. I don't know, I mean, the person who said the thing about Palestine, you mentioned the firebombing of, of a synagogue sort of like on the side, you know, as if it was a little minor thing. I mean, I don't think I would ever have thought that something like that was a minor incident. So I think we, I've always considered anti-Semitism as a, as a grave problem for our society. And I've always considered it as, as one of the most shameful expressions of anti-humanism. Um, and I, I, I don't see the Palestinians in, um, in Berlin. I, most of the people protesting and shouting, um, demanding death to Israel and to Jews, I suspect many of them aren't pa actually Palestinians. I read an article yesterday, and um, the police has now done a lot of research on this, say most of them actually are Syrians, apparently, in, in Berlin, not Palestinians at all. Um, and I don't see them fighting for a Palestinian state at all. I see them just uh, ranting against uh, against Jews, supporting a terrorist organization without any demands for, for um, national self-determination of Palestinians. And I, I don't see how I can possibly um, side, uh, I can possibly support that. Thanks, Sabina. Daniel, some quick thoughts. 
Yeah, well, to come back on a couple of things. First of all, and this is a point I made at the Battle of Ideas session on anti-Semitism, which I think was filmed, so I talk about it more fully there. People do need to understand the difference between Islamism, which is a political movement which exists within the Muslim community, and the Muslim community as a whole. And Islamism, as part of its doctrine, is an anti-Semitic movement from the very beginning. It sees Jews as a symbol of cosmic evil. That's how they talk about Jews. Uh, so it's a political movement that has a lot of Western influences uh, and exists within the Muslim community. Uh, and there's a lot of what people don't understand, and I want to write a lot more in the next few months explaining this to, so people understand it more fully. There's a lot of overlap between this and Western identity politics, which is why I picked up on the quote at the beginning, the Hamas quote about victimhood, because that is kind of that ide Islam, Islamic identity politics and victimhood. There's a lot of parallels between that and Western identity politics. They're kind of anti-modern, anti-democratic, intolerant of criticism. Uh, so they're very, very close. To, so to understand what's really going on here, you need to understand that dynamic. Just to come back on admin, uh, having a go at me, he's, he's half right. He's half right. So 30 years ago or so, more than 30 years ago, my views were quite different in relation to Israel. I was much more critical of Israel. Uh, and I think, thing, but I think things have changed. First of all, I think I, I underestimated the resilience of anti-Semitism and how strong it was. I also think back then there was much more of a kind of liberation movement among the Palestinians. So I think objective circumstances have changed. But he is not right to say that I've changed 180 degrees. And he obviously hasn't bothered to read my recent articles, which he should do if he wants to make a serious criticism of me. Because virtually every single article I write which talks about the Palestinians, says that I support the right to national self-determination for the Palestinians. I've not changed my opinion on that, and I state it very strongly. Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry. No, not, not to worry. Uh, do I turn the sound off? Uh, no. What, what, what I say is that one reason that I oppose uh, Hamas is precisely because it's against Palestinian national self-determination. It's got a genocidal attitude towards Jews, but at the same time, its doctrine is to have an Islamized Palestine as part of its goal of having an international Islamic order. So Hamas itself is very, very hostile to Palestinian national self-determination. So I've not changed on that point. I still support national self-determination for the Palestinians. And one reason I oppose Hamas is precisely because it's opposed to that as well. It doesn't support. It's a, Hamas is an anti-Palestinian organisation, not a pro-Palestinian organisation. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, I'm sure we'll pick this up some more. I'll take some more questions. I'll take a few more than I did last time because there's now a lot of people we want to get for as many as possible. So, uh, Sybil. Right. Um, I just wanted to ask Laura and um daniel maybe sabina can answer the question from a german perspective really where this thing about british values comes into it um i'm sort of in a horribly way horrible way gripped by the covid inquiry that's going on at the moment and it strikes me that uh, the concept of british values seems to be kind of extraordinarily sort of nostalgic or something that's rather artificially constructed and i'm not sure that uh, a certain kind of British values has been sort of particularly welcoming to my Jewish forebears. We were sort of let in very, very grudgingly. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, trying to reconstruct some kind of little England politics doesn't strike me as something that's particularly attractive. So unless we were retreating to some kind of um, rather dubious nationalism, it, it's maybe that question about how, how how do we create a society that is both multicultural, which has it welcomes its Jewish citizens, which is a tolerant society, but which also, you know, is it just about kind of failure of police and the failure of government and that to get hold of this one? And if we've got a stronger police and a more courageous government, that we could um have a society in which Jewish people felt felt safer. Yep. Okay, thanks, and, and a nice point. Okay, we'll now take Josephine Hussey. Hi, um, I was just, um, one of the things that really concerns me is um, university students, young people who are very, very much pro-Palestinian, 
Palestine. Um, and obviously there's a lot of very old fashioned left views within the universities that are influencing young people. Um, looking at what's happened, I totally agree with Daniel and I listened to his um, broadcast on TNT radio and really totally understand that there are three issues here. There's the um, there's Israel, there's Palestine, and then there's Hamas. And we have to deal with Hamas. We can't deal with anything until we've dealt with Hamas. But when it comes to young people, if you you can't argue about the history, right? Um, uh, you might say, oh, you know, the Israel has done this and the Israel have done that to try and appease, um, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Um, and you can't argue that what happened on the 7th of October was worse than, the, than what's happening at the moment to people in Gaza. You, you're just going, more people died then, babies are dying there now, that kind of thing. And for me, the crux of the matter is the fact that um, the, what Daniel mentioned about the identity politics. And I feel like it comes from the history to a certain extent that Palestinians have always been seen to be the victims of colonialism. And the is Israel have always been seen to be supported by America and Britain um, as colonialists. But obviously what being a victim means today and what being a colonialist means today are two different things to what they uh, meant in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, what I want to know, um, and this is a very difficult question, is how do we then explain the difference to young people who hadn't haven't lived through what we understood to be colonialism in the past or imperialism or whatever you want to call it, and what we understood to be people who were um, being oppressed. And I think, you know, admin had a very good point in the sense that um, it's that move from um, what we understood in the past of what was going on and the, the identity politics that's being ascribed to it today. Great, thanks. Now, that's a nice point that, that my discussions with people as well, I've found that there's a, a real gulf between what people uh, would understand and sort of the historical education on this. So I think talking about how we engage people beyond beyond is a very important point. I'll take Eve next. Yeah, my um, interest in this goes back to lockdown, where I joined a anti-lockdown group called Stop the New Normal that was um, headed up by Piers Corbyn um, and spent the entire year arguing with a hardcore of anti-Semites who every week would post memes. Um, uh, and I, I couldn't believe it. I'd said to my husband, you know, I don't think that, um, I think that, uh, you know, I sort of cast out on the, the idea that um, anti-Semitism was on the rise and saw the attack on Jeremy Corbyn as a kind of right wing plot by um, the right wing media. Um, but then I saw with my own eyes that it was it, it was on the rise. Um, so my interest goes back two years. And in that time, I've been sort of going back over um some of the history of Israel and sort of educating myself. Um, and it, I think the, the the two key things that seem to have changed is that, um, number one, the, 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 the this isn't an anti... The, the Palestinians versus Israel is no longer an anti-imperialist struggle like it used to be back in the day when um, the guy from admin um, was involved in politics. Because, because in 2007... Um, the, the PLO were booted out of Gaza and Hamas took over. Um, and, and and what is, if you want to understand the difference in, in approach to why um, people are saying that the 7th of October is the starting point, it's because you, if you look at the impulse behind the 7th of October, it was an unprovoked attack. There had been, um, there had been, you know, ba basically they had spent 15 years since 2007 tooling up. And then they attacked and killed uh, completely innocent civilians. Whereas if you look at the military response, uh, the military response by Israel, what the, what the aims of that is, is to release the um, hostages, close down the tunnels and, and destroy Hamas. Um, and that those 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 war aims feel to me like necessary in order to stop the the wipe at the further kind of eradication of Jews for the sake of being Jews, so th there's there's a clear difference between one a sort of um, a, 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 
the, the state that a state that has the right to exist um and Hamas which is basically sort of a genus has these genocidal aims okay great thanks Eve uh we'll keep it going so Flynn you're up next hi uh I think it's important that we realize the role of the media in amplifying and exaggerating horror uh, I participated in the pro-Palestine march two weeks ago, and in fact, uh, last week for 20 minutes before the drinks reception on Saturday. Uh, and not once did I hear the word jihad or the phrase gas the Jews or death to Israel. Uh, so I find it rather hard to believe the media when their accounts are different to my own. Uh, I'd also like to mention that I have many left wing and pro-Palestine friends and none of them support Hamas. They all recognize the horror of their actions. Uh, and they all support a two-state solution. So I think we need to not be so hasty to generalise those who don't support the Israeli government as all being anti-Semitic. Great, thanks. That, that's that's a very important and useful point. And I th- as I said in the introduction, I think we, the, an important aim of this discussion is to try and uh, distinguish between what's really going on and where it's expressed and without necessarily kind of overarching the, the problem. Um, uh, Claire, the director of the Academy of Ideas, was referenced in one of the earlier points, so I'd like to see if she wants to come in. Okay, are we on? Um, maybe I can uh, respond, actually, to both Flynn and I think it's uh, Jagdish, who was, who was admin, if I recognise correctly. Um, when I say... Um, that certain things changed for me some years ago. Um, I remember uh, I just was visiting Liverpool and there was a pro-Palestinian small demonstration going on, calling for a boycott. And the demonstration, I was kind of looking on because I support Palestinian self-determination. I was at another event and suddenly the group stormed into Marks and Spencers shouting, you know, uh, about Jewish owners and so on of, of the Marks and Spencers. And I nearly, I got such a shock I couldn't believe it was happening. That was 10 years ago or so. And I realised that things had really changed and people have to acknowledge that things have changed. And one of the things that is really shocking for me is that this confusion between the support for Palestinian self-determination and saying, oh, well, I didn't hear, Flynn said, oh, I didn't hear any anti-Semitism. That's fine. But I can assure you that there are people who are shouting anti-Semitic slogans on demonstrations and I have not seen widespread condemnation by people on those demonstrations. Certainly that Liverpool demo was full of lefties, colleagues of mine from the old days, and they kind of went along with it. They didn't distance themselves from it at all. And similarly, I was I wrote about this in a book on free speech where I was invited to speak to a sixth form school. I went in to give the speech on free speech. And some of the students, well, a lot of the students in the lesson told me that 9-11 was a, a Jewish at- attack and um, that ISIS were heroic freedom fighters and so on and so forth. And I argued back and, and they said they were offended and they tried to get me banned. The thing that was extraordinary about that was that the teacher who had invited me kept congratulating me on my bravery for not going along with it. And I thought, God, I wasn't brave. Was I? What was I meant to do? I was hardly going to agree with that. But that was the kind of tone of the discussion. And to just say, when I talk to those students, and I've been in many situations like that, these 17 year olds about the Middle East, they knew nothing about the Middle East. In fact, they weren't interested in the Middle East. (laughs) I kept trying to tell them something about the history of the Middle East and Palestine, all the rest of it. No interest whatsoever. They were pretty clear it was Jews as evil. Just final point, um, which is to say that those people who complain that those of us who are worried about the rise of anti-Semitism don't understand Palestine, don't understand uh, Palestinian self-determination or what Israel has done in Palestine. It's a little bit like the way that people say to me, what do you mean you don't support Black Lives Matter or critical race theory? I thought you were an anti-racist. Well, they're not the same thing. They're a different thing. And if you can't tell the difference, we're in trouble. So those people who don't understand that what has changed is that what was a liberation struggle is now a vicious Islamist cult that hates the West, hates infidels, and is actually no use to the Palestinian uh, fight for self-determination. People who haven't noticed that political difference, I think, are causing a real problem. Thanks a lot, Claire. Uh, we'll, we'll take maybe a couple more and then I'll get the panel in. So there's someone on iPhone who there, there's someone who's next up.
Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Um, a little bit of a technology problem. Um, well, I, I, you know, I agree that things have changed. And um, but I want to come back on this thing about not everybody who's anti-Israel is an anti-Semite. And I think what we have to recognize is this is a war situation and it's not our job to second guess the IDF, um, but it is our job to decide, um, uh, you know, we, we do need this political uh, criticism. And I think that we we should stand up for the Israeli state and um, because it's a war situation. And the way I understand it in terms of the past, I think the exaggeration, uh, I think the um, the progressiveness of the Palestinian uh, liberation organization may have been um, overstated. But the fact is, there's never been a strong solidarity movement across the world, actually, against anti-Semitism. And after World War II, I think Jews realized that they were on their own. And when the UN carved out a tiny slice um, of the Middle East for um, Jewish people to set up the Israeli state, um, what they did was um, they did two things. First of all, they built a military fortress to protect themselves because they were constantly under attack by um, their neighbors. But I think most, most importantly, they built um, a Western democracy, um, a very successful capitalist society in the middle of the desert um, as, a, as a champion in some ways to Western civilization. And I think that that's one of um, that's part of um, the um, um, what the current protesters don't like, because it's almost as if as if Israel didn't exist, they'd have to, um, you know, invent it because Israel stands for everything that they reject and everything that they're taught to reject in the in, in colleges um, mm -hmm. about freedom, about democracy. And as I said before, Western uh, civilization. And that's why I think it's too correct to say that this fight is our fight, not in the sense that, you know, we're not actually being physically attacked at the moment. And it's our responsibility to protect Jewish people from attack because we know that we can't rely on the police um, to do that. But when we say we stand with the Jewish people, I think we have to get across to people that this is not the old anti-Semitism just come back that exists for all time. What's new about this is the threat to Western civilization and Western values. And I think okay. if, if, if we can explain that, then hopefully people won't be standing up for Jews just because they feel sorry for them. OK, thanks. Uh, let's take Gareth and then we'll get the panel in. Hiya, can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, on this thing about uh, Palestinian self-determination, um, I mean, aside from, you know, what's changed from the past, I can never get uh, anyone who's going on the the rallies and is in support of um, of those demonstrations to explain how what Hamas has done furthers the course of Palestinian self-determination. What was the likely response from Israel to what Hamas did? It, it, everybody knows what uh, is, Israel would do in such a situation. Hamas knew that, and it's a well-worn technique. Hamas invite these massive reprisals from Israel. They keep civilians within Hamas's own areas, civilians die, babies are retrieved from the rubble, and it's exactly the kind of message that Hamas wants to send. Look at the iniquity of Israel. In what way is that going to do absolutely anything to advance Palestinian self-determination? It set it back years, in my opinion. The bigger problem is seeing self-determination as somehow aligned with Islamism. If you 
are in support of self-determination for the Palestinians, you have to somehow go on the rally and support uh, w- what's what's been done. And the, the Palestinian National Authority, Fatah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, all of them have utterly, utterly betrayed self-determination. It would be nice if we heard that from podiums on these rallies. The, the, the final point I'd say is that Quite it nice. seems that people in the West are aligning themselves with the Palestinian cause because they think it's radical and they think it's revolutionary, but they don't realise who and what it is that they're actually aligning themselves with. And I think that's why Daniel's really onto something by warning of this alliance, if you like, between identitarianism in the in the West and radical is- Islam in the Middle East. I think that's a, a absolutely central danger of, of our current times. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I'll bring in the panel. I'll ask you to be as, as brief as you can. There's obviously the one thing to get to grips with is that on the one hand, this identification that lots of people make or say we should make between Jews and Israel. And similarly, there's a kind of identification going on between Palestine and Hamas or people supporting or going on pro-Palestine marching in Hamas. And I'm not so sure as maybe some of our contributors have been that we can automatically make those uh, those conjunctions on on both sides of the discussion. So I wonder if the panel can clear that up a little bit for me. But Daniel, any thoughts? Well, yeah, just to expand on what I said in my introduction. I mean, I think people can make criticisms of what I call a flesh and blood Israel, just as they can make criticisms of Britain or Hungary or any other country. But when people talk about Israel as the symbol of evil, apartheid, colonialist, racist, imperialist, and so on, that is anti-Semitic. So they may not, it may not be, some people, when they hear anti-Semitism, they think of it in terms of old-fashioned uh, Nazi anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Semitism, so, you know, swastikas and talking about yids and so on. But a key contemporary form anti-Semitism takes is this kind of accepting the symbolism of Israel as the epitome of evil in the world, which not I don't think everyone on these marches does, but I think a lot of them do. Uh, and a lot of people really... Uh, underestimate that so uh, yeah i think that's a real problem and i think it is it's better also to characterize these marches not as pro-palestinian they're not generally pro-palestinian marches they're not calling for palestinian self-determination they are anti-israel marches in that sense very negative marches uh, and they're anti-israel precisely because they see it in these kind of evil terms and even this slogan from the river to the sea is very interesting it's criticized i think quite rightly for being an anti-semitic slogan but, but in addition to that, uh, it's very interesting how it kind of sidesteps the question of Palestinian national self-determination. Because it's just saying wipe out the Jews. You know, the, the PLO, which had many faults, used to talk about we believe in a secular democratic state for the Palestinians. There was some kind of conception of that national self-determination. From the river to the sea is, is an Islamist slogan and completely consistent with the view of uh, wipe out the Jews, no Palestinian state, let's move towards an international Islamic order. So these are anti-Israel slogans, they're not pro-Palestinian slogans. Great, thanks, Daniel. Uh, Laura, some thoughts? Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, talking about Israel being the epitome of the evil, I'd like to tie back into one of the first comments earlier, which was questioning what I mean about British values. It's a really tricky question. Um, I do think it's important to understand that Israel is seen as the epitome of evil, because although I was so strong on anti-Semitism in my opening comments, I think there's something else that's going on with the anti-Israel feeling. In a way, Israel is is acting as an epitome, as a proxy for all of the anti-Western feeling and lots of Western self-hatred. There it is as a beacon of democracy in the Middle East. The IDF uh, go over and above what any other state's military do when they mount these operations. And the people that are cheering Hamas in this country are, are cheering for a side that would see the return of Sharia law, putting homosexuals in prison or killing them, and removing women's choice of dress, agency and movement from them. So when people are um, anti-Israel, over here, from the safety of our country, there's something, I think, self-hating about it. So I understand what the lady before was saying about little England politics, but I'm actually just tired of supposed to be being ashamed of being 
British, English, Western. And when I think of British values, I think of democracy, liberty, liberty, tolerance, but not cowardice, which is what it's more morphed into, being hardworking and the Christian values that underpin our country, including very importantly, the idea that all life is sacred. And I think we should be prouder about where we've come from and and who we are. Um, somebody mentioned media bias earlier, and I would like to flip that round. I don't dis I don't agree at all with your perception of the media bias. I think the biggest disgrace is that the media still aren't calling Hamas what it is, which is a terrorist organisation, and that is completely misleading the public perception of events. Um, I think it's probably directly contributing towards anti-Semitism because it creates a completely false impression of a moral equivalence between a state, which has a right to exist, and a vile terrorist organisation. And then one more point to come back to, um, university students were mentioned earlier, and I think it's important to acknowledge how ignorant um, young people's knowledge of history is. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to throw my own sons into the mix here. I was talking to them and they said, oh, maybe the Holocaust wasn't that bad. I was a little bit shocked, you know, um, but this is not uncommon because a lot of students at school aren't really taught about history. I took my kids to the Holocaust exhibition when they were probably a bit too young to remember it, maybe a bit too young to see it and for it to sink in. But I, I think that at the moment, young kids are, and teenagers, young people, they're getting a lot of information from Tic Tac, TikTok, distressingly. Mm. Sorry, I can't believe I called it Tic Tac. What a grandma. Um, uh, TikTok. And they're actually not very au fait with history. And that's the problem. You know, there's there's a kind of podological problem here that a lot of young people don't know history. Not all young people, but a lot. Yeah. And so how can they understand everything that's happening without some basic facts? Yeah. OK, thanks. Sabina? Um, I, I found it interesting when um, I, I can't remember the name I said, went to demonstrations and he said it's very clear that um, people do were shocked and reject the Hamas attack. And I noticed that too. So I have kids and I, I know exactly the same. I know that young people who've sided with Palestine, um, not much. Um, and I've talked to them and all of them said, yes, the Hamas attack was really horrible. But what Israel did then and kind of um, attack um, Gaza, that's, that's a completely different matter. And I found that interesting. So to me, the question is, is it only OK to be against anti-Semitism or let's say pro-Israel if Israelis are victims? So there's this kind of victim culture behind it, as long as they're victims and will concede to being victims, then it's okay and you can side with them. But when people start defending themselves, and Israel has always been a state which has always made very clear that it's willing to defend itself and uh, survive, then problems come in. And I think that's a very problematic thing. It, it says more about us than about Israel, because it says something about our willingness to stand and defend um, our our way of life and, and, and what we stand for. And, and in that sense, I do agree with people um, saying it's also about defending Western values because Israel, unlike um, uh, the Hamas and Gaza, is, is with all its faults, a democratic state. And I was going to say it's actually quite interesting because when we talk about the, uh, the Muslim world or, the, or Islam, uh, Arab states, it's not completely homogeneous. So when I went to the pro-Israel demonstration here in Berlin, I noticed there were a lot of Iranians, for example, who joined the demonstration. And there was a lot of support for Israel. There's also a lot of support, by the way, for Israel amongst young Iranians. And I think that's very logical because Iranians have understood and have seen now since 1977 what it means to live under a, an Islamist dictatorship and how repressive it is. And what I say to the friends of my children is, I don't understand you guys, all of them support gay rights, many of them even LGBTQ whatever rights, just try and defend these rights, either in Iran, which supports Hamas, or in Gaza, and you'll, you'll see the end of your life very, very quickly. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a complete muddle, and I think, and, and, and I think there's so much going, so much in, in this, and I think it's, it's basically the victim culture and we have to reject that. And that's why, you know, standing for Israel as it defends itself is, is God, absolutely important and not just defending it when it's being attacked. Great. Thanks. OK, we'll come out to the floor and let's try and keep these as swift as possible. We start with Kerry. 
Hi, uh, thank you very much to Daniel, uh, Sabina and Laura for very incisive remarks, particularly the equation of uh, victim culture with what's going on, which I think is very real. I've got a couple of quick questions, but maybe they require too big an answer. Firstly, I just wonder what the, maybe Daniel can answer this, what the prospects for Israel are, because it does seem that uh, at the moment, this, any support for Israel is waning and it's becoming again more isolated. And that's, I find quite frightening. I mean, I, I'm a humanist and argue for, you know, humanity and against war all the time, but I'm not a pacifist. And I do think in these circumstances, we have to stand on the side of Israel with none of these buts, given what Hamas is responsible for. But I'm very worried that the international order is backing off and backing off and backing off. Um, and, and that's quite terrifying. And I think the that's giving even greater credence to these Palestinian, pro-Palestinian, uh, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic demonstrations. Second question, very quickly, why aren't any of the journalists, and you see them every day, and I go through all the different news channels, asking any basic questions at all. They never, nobody ever says, why are we believing um, all the reports from Gaza that are put out by Hamas? Why, why do we believe that? You know, who asks how many of the people who've been killed are actually Hamas fighters and murderers and terrorists? Who asks that? You know, do we want these people to survive? And then just a smaller questions, I'm quite worried about Remembrance Day in Britain and what's going to happen on that and if people have got thoughts about what we should do. And lastly, what do people make, maybe I've got this wrong, about this petition that's going around. I mean, it's quite humorous, but quite it's rather good in a way. This guy in apparently in Central Park with a petition intervened in some pro-Palestinian freedom demonstration with a petition saying, you know, support Palestinian freedom, you know, understand why Hamas is acting as it is. People come up to sign, then he said, have you read the terms of, in I'd just like you to read the terms of agreement before you sign. And it says, do you know that Hamas will take away the rights of women? It will slaughter homosexuals, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And I thought doing something similar would be quite a good idea because I think the young people I talk to are really taken with all the white privilege arguments and have no, don't really think about what Hamas is and what Islamism is because they are so concerned not to be Islamophobic. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, there's, I'll try and keep it flowing as quickly as possible. So, John. Oh, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Right. Um, I'll try and be as brief as I can. Um, I could say an awful lot because I mean, 40 years ago when I was at university, the PLO used to regularly have um, stands giving out the literature, etc. And um, I've travelled around the Middle East. But there's a couple of points I would just like to make. I think some of the comments made are a little bit back to front. Um, I don't think it's anti-Semitic at all when it's suggested that um, people don't openly protest, have marches against what's happening in China or um, Saudi Arabia, for example. I think, quite frankly, it's the opposite. Israelis are seen, for want of a better phrase, as like us. They're held up to European standards. China is basically a communist fascist state. Saudi Arabia is um, a fascist theocratic state. And I grew up in the 70s when innocent civilians were being blown up by the IRA. If Britain was behaving then like Israel behaves now, we'd have been bombing housing estates in Dublin, saying, yeah, sorry, we've killed a couple of innocent, a couple of hundred innocent um, Irish people, but we think we've got um, an RA commander. But we don't behave like that, and we in the West expect Israel to behave to Western standards. I mean, okay. that's just how it is. Um, Israel's an, in an incredibly privileged situation. It's a country with a high standard of living that's the biggest recipient of US aid. So th there's a lot of, um, I think, misplaced arguments here. Uh, the other thing I okay. want to stress um, is that um, 
I don't think it's never stated openly, but almost every day in the news a year about these 200 or so um, Israeli hostages being held by Hamas. It must be horrendous. It must be horrendous for the relatives. But to put this in perspective, that figure of 200, it's about 70% of the amount of civilians that Israel's been killing on average every single day since the 7th of October. And the thing that bothers okay. me... There's, can, can we leave it there? Yeah. Thanks. Well, okay. I can say leave it there. I've not finished the point, but... Well, the, no, you've just been speaking for a while. I was wondering if you're coming to a conclusion. Okay. Yeah. And th thanks. No, it's, it's important to have the discussion, and I just want to carry on and get as many people as possible. So, okay. Mark? Hi. Thanks. Um, I think the big problem that's been touched on um, a few times is we've got anti-Western sentiment that is being expressed through anti-Israeli and anti-Semitic ideas. And I think that's, as Laura said, it's a proxy. So the problem now is that the more that you want to show how caring you are and the more you want to uh, show that you're a good person uh, with the right values, the more you need to oppose Israel. And increasingly, that will be the more that you will oppose Jews. So I don't think there's any point in arguing about the slogans that we're hearing on the demos, you know, whether whether they are or aren't anti-Semitic today, because I think it's almost certain that they will be tomorrow if they're not today, because that's the direction of travel. If that's how um, you express yourself as a good and virtuous person, to be currently anti-Israel, um, boycotting products, daubing slogans on buildings, ripping down posters of hostages, these people aren't cowards. I don't. These people aren't stupid. They they think they're doing the right thing. They think they're expressing the right thing, and that's what makes it all the more dangerous. Um, I'll go so even so far as to say these are our own hostages. These young people, they're hostages. They're being held uh, hostage by this barbaric uh, ideology. Um, and the key thing here, though, the step from this is that they are, and I think the previous speaker kind of gets to this, we are allowing Hamas uh, to set the moral dial. We're setting the moral compass. So the, what is good and bad and what is being decided here is being decided by Hamas. And young people are being influenced by this. And the basically the indifference that people are showing towards what happened on October the 7th means that the whole moral compass has just been <laughs> just been removed. Right. So I do think, uh, to Josephine's point, I do think we have to talk about body counts. I do think we have to kind of get to grips. It's not you don't need facts, you don't need history, you don't need to know about 67 and 48 and 73 and 2005 to basically say, look, your moral dial has just is, is non-existent. And we have to get people to, to really understand what happened on October the 7th. Um, because this is um this is a, a, a kind of recalibration that's gone on, and our young people. <laughs> like I say, are hostages. A few people have mentioned, this is one sentence, sorry, Jacob, a few people have mentioned um, our campaign, Your Fight is Our Fight, uh, and uh, David and, and Jean mentioned it, and David has, has put a link in the uh, chat as well to our new website. So okay. if people get the chance, yeah. please look at it and register people and sign can up. Go now. Okay, Thank you. thanks a lot. Um, if if this is the, and this is admin, or, or again, then come back in quickly to respond to those points I made to you, but I want to keep it very quick. Yeah, I'm not going to try and respond to all the different kind of incidents where people say, oh, look, they, there is one bad action here, and there is one bad action there by this government, etc. So I'm not going to report, uh, uh, go on to that. I'm just, again, very disappointed with, with that, Daniel, and the reasons why he says, 30 years have changed. Nothing has changed in 30 years, you know, with the situation that is going on in Palestine. And if you were prepared to say before that the biggest recruiting sergeant for anti-Semitism in Europe is the, is the oppressive act of the Israeli government, today, you're, 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 obviously, your mind has changed completely. What I say to people, a lot of people are saying things which are either historically inaccurate or they haven't really kind of read enough. And I would, I would suggest that you go and read people like... Uh, you know, normal Finkelstein and uh, Noam Chomsky. Both of them are Jewish. Both of them have got all the kind of credentials you're looking for, but are world authorities on what's been going on in Gaza and so on. Um, and you will you will find out a lot more about, uh, you know, what the the actual the state of the affairs is. 
I completely but, agree with people who said, and I think you said that, Jacob, is that you cannot conflate. So what's what's happened now is that they've turned Israel uh, going after Hamas, right? Because Hamas killed Jews. So Israel is not going to go and kill Palestinians. So it's now been turned into an anti-Semitic thing when effectively uh, you got Israel, who's, well, there's about 11 countries out of 195 countries, 11 countries have designated Hamas as a, uh, as a terrorist organization. The same suspects, the settler colonialist countries, you know, like the United States, Britain, okay. France, etc. right? They're the ones. The other countries, the majority of the world, do not think that. And for people who think that the world revolves around, you know, Europe and the, the so-called West, right? You got to wake up because those days are gone now, right? Okay. The industry is, is, is moved on. And I think, uh, you know, things are going to have to change quite dramatically. So keep, stop aping uh, this thing about Hamas is a terrorist. Talk about specifics. What has Hamas specifically done? And you look at what the Israeli government has specifically done, okay. including the Isra the people in Israel who were jumping and dancing <sighs> when you and like, hundreds of babies got killed in in uh, uh, um in, in Gaza, right? You've okay, got to really compare like with like. Time okay. to move on. Thank you. Let's leave it there. Um. So Stephanie. Hi. Uh, this is actually not Stephanie. It's, it doesn't matter though. Um. So I think uh we're. I think we don't we don't there's there's a missing piece to if we if we look at the people who really criticize uh, 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 the the I'm sorry I'm not used to speaking before so many people. It's uh, fun. They're not in the room with you, so it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, if we if we uh, crit criticize uh, the 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 what's it called. Israel, Israel, Israel. Thanks. Um, when when we uh, the people who criticize Israel and and even even re, uh, the 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 anti semites like those who aren't just amb ambiguous, those who really say death to all Jews, we still need to see uh, and look at who is it that's that's uh, saying these things, because I believe there's a really a qualitative uh, difference be between someone who is uh, grieving a big loss, who's lo probably lost a lot of family and was uh, greatly humiliated, maybe thrown out of their own home. And a uh, big difference between those who actually profit of these anti-Semitic statements, like, for example, the Hamas, who use it uh, to, to, to get the people uh, to, to, to be their soldiers, to, to, to keep their influence, or the Iran, for example, too. Um, so I believe there's a big difference, and even though uh, anti-Semitism is a very bad thing. I, there's there's no arguing about it. Uh, we still need to uh, look who it is. Is it someone who is actually in power and uses it, or is it an actual victim of abuse and and uh, and uh, <clears throat> violence? Who who really d just feels it? Okay. You know? And. Right. Uh, yeah, no, if, if, if I think that that point is very well made. So thank you, and we'll 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 carry well, it. I, I I'd like to. I have one more point, but I'll I'll be brief if it's all right. One sentence. Then I can't. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll leave it there. Then we'll come back to you if we can. Um, it's just we got so many people. I'm already having to ask the panel to be uh, generous, and we'll come back to you in a second. But I want to get as many people in as possible. As uh, Stuart Wayson. Yeah. Um. I was glad that the question was asked uh, about Daniel's past. He's then spoiled it by trying to, I don't know what he thinks Hamas is, a kind of uh, school brigade or something. But anyway, um, my question, I, I, was on a, I was on a radio station today and the individual I was talking to said that Netanyahu funded Hamas um, to undermine Palestinians. So I'd be interested to know what you think about that. Um, I'd also be interested to know, you say you support Palestinian liberation or, a, um, what does that mean in today's context? Um, and finally, were you surprised, because I was, at the number of young people who appear to support Palestinians? I mean, I, I wasn't surprised at Black Lives Matter because, you know, young people know America anti-racism is kind of, you know, ingrained. But I had no idea that young people knew anything at all about Palestine. Um, and suddenly we seem to have 
all these young people on demonstrations. Uh, uh, and that surprised me. Great, thanks. Okay, I'll take Anne, and if the panel let me, then maybe one more and we'll come back. Um, I think um, it's a mind-numbingly stupid to imagine the things having changed in politics over 30 years. I mean, for God's sake, it's changed in every country over 30 years. Um, Hamas, politics has changed. Hamas is completely different to anything that existed 30 years ago. And the idea that we have to dispute what terrorism is in relation to Hamas also seems to me to be mind-numbingly stupid. I mean, you only have to look at October 7th to have an example of what terror is and the difference between um, what happened on October the 7th and the Israeli response, which is basically a declaration of war. Um, but what I, and a legitimate declaration of war. What I wanted to, what puzzles me immensely is um, whether support is for the Jewish community in Britain. I'm not really so surprised that so many people, so many younger people uh, supporting Hamas, given the, 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 the whole Black Lives Matter thing that we've had. But it, it, you know, it really seems to me that if you compare what's going on at the moment to what happened with the um, Ukraine-Russia war, is extraordinary. Um, I mean, thanks, Laura, massively for getting that petition started and so on ar around. My first response um, after the 7th of October was, where can we get flags? What can we do, given that uh, um, at the start of the Ukraine war and so on, you couldn't see anything for blue and yellow flags in people's windows who wouldn't know where Ukraine was on the map and who the most they knew about Kiev was that it was a kind of chicken or something. Do you know what I mean? It's just like that complete distance from it. Lionel Shriver made an interesting point in her, in a piece that she wrote uh, for The Spectator today. And I'd like to know what Daniel thinks about this actually, because I don't know. Um, I tend to think that she's right, uh, but it feels a bit brutal. And she makes the, the point that, you know, Hamas, running Gaza and were able to carry out that attack and indeed their anti-Western pogrom because they were voted into that position by the people in Hamas who she said, you know, what was it? They won for, uh, either by 44% or 44% of the population voted for them. That being the case, it would seem to suggest that Hamas are a problem to be sorted out by the people who allow them to take power. I don't know enough about the situation to know whether or not that's true. Mm. Um, okay. But I'd like to know what you think. Okay. Uh, I'll take Mike. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just a, a little bit of background. Um, a word that tends to get um, um, banded around an awful lot um, in conversations like this, is Nazis. Um, and um, just a couple of weeks ago, this uh, book was published, if you can see, you can see that. It's told, called Nazis, Islamic Antisemitism and the Middle East. It's published by Routledge and uh, by the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. It's by a German political scientist um, historian called Matthias Kutzel. And it really, it looks at the actual real activities of of the National Socialist Party in the 1930s in the Middle East and the way they tried to influence Arab thinking against the Jewish presence that was all, already there. And um, and in particular, it then focuses on how that fed into to, uh, the, the enmities and feelings and, 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 and thinking that led to the 1948 war. And obviously the 1948 war has led, has led to everything else. So I think that's a very, very um, uh, pertinent and timely uh, uh, timely um, publication. The the event took took place at my old college, University College London, just a couple okay. of weeks ago. So 
Uh, as I say, there is there is something there that, that, that perhaps people ought to read just to get a, a serious grounding in uh, you know the, 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 a way that will take them away from uh, using the word, words like Nazis. Not that I think people here do you know in, in an offhand way. Um, there was one little um, aphorism though that, that the fellow Matthias Kunzel came out with that's probably worth um, um, uh, repeating here. He he gave us a very quick uh, uh, definition of the difference between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. It's very simple. He said anti-Judaism is the belief that everything Jewish is bad. Anti-Semitism is the belief that everything bad is Jewish. Yeah. All right, thanks. Nice. Maybe you can stick the name of the book in the chat and people can pick it up. Uh, okay. Anor, do, if you're very brief, can I bring you back in and then we will probably have just about have enough time to get everybody else in. So, uh, Laura, some quick thoughts. You're on mute. Sorry. Every time. Sorry. OK, so somebody said earlier that um, Israel is simply being held up to a higher account because it's a they're like us. I mean, I respect your point of view, but I do have to put forward a counter argument. I don't think that when people are marching in the streets in this country, they're holding Israel to a higher account. No, they're treating Israel differently. Because these aren't pro-Palestine marches, they're anti-Israel marches. Um, and I do think it's a thread of anti-Semitism that runs through it. So somebody also asked earlier why journalists have done such a terrible job in repeating Hamas's statistics and explanations. Because Hamas, after all, um, baby beheaders. I'm not quite sure why journalists are parroting everything they say. But there's two things. First of all, journalism is really not what it used to be. And there are a lot of activist journalists who are being very partisan in the way they cover this. And secondly, there's the cultural mediation hypothesis. It is much easier to get on in this world if you go along with the dominant cultural narrative. And that's why we're also talking about cowardice tonight. People don't like speaking up because they have to say something that's unpopular. You know, I said at the beginning, because I've been pro-Israel, I've knocked a couple of thousand pounds off my annual income because I've lost Substack subscribers. That's OK. I don't mind being a bit poor for doing the right thing. You don't even need to congratulate me for it. But you know what? It's actually hard to do that if you're salaried. I, I can take the decision to take the hit, but not everyone feels they're able to. So how do you counter this cultural mediation hypothesis? You need to throw some psychology back at it. Um, that's one reason that a little group of us set up the October Declaration, because you need to show that there are social norms in your on your side. So we got over 200 of the great and good. And I think coming up for 70,000 members of the public who signed say they stand with British Jews. They condemn terrorism and they want the BBC and other media to call Hamas a terrorist organisation. So you have to counter group psychology with more group psychology. And also it helps the cowardice aspect because people feel that they can then speak up. Okay. Um, with just one more thing about young people who have been marching um, on the pro-Palestine rallies, because it's come up a few times in a little way. I think it's um, on psychology again. Something I've noticed is you can't just, um, you can't tell people they're wrong. You should never do that anyway. But especially with young people, they go off in a different direction. I've noticed it with my sons. They have regurgitated some truly terrible Andrew Tate opinions on Palestine. And if I say, no, you're wrong, he's wrong. They just think I'm some old idiot who doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. And... So a format like this, but in a kind of a mini condensed family version is a good idea. Just asking questions and dropping little seeds with young people so that they can follow their own line of thought to a, hopefully a different conclusion if they don't think that yep. the Holocaust was so bad or they're in support of Sharia law. OK, thanks. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, just to quickly answer a couple of questions and make a, a brief point. So... In response to Anne's question, I haven't read Lionel Shriver's, Shriver's article yet, but from your account of it, it misses out an important thing. So Israel withdrew unilaterally from Gaza in 2005. At the end of 2006, there was an election, which Hamas narrowly won. But then in 2007, it purged, it killed its kind of nationalist opponents. And since then, there's been no election. So obviously, Hamas does have some support in Gaza, but it's not democratic. You know, there was an election... Um, many years ago, and then it killed basically its opponents. So uh, I don't think it's true to see, in any sense, Hamas being a democratic uh, organisation. Uh, I was horrified by the stats that 
in America, almost half of young people, 18 to 24 year olds, support Hamas. Well, if they said this, that they had sympathy for the Palestinians, that's fine. But in this survey, 48% said they supported Hamas. Doesn't mean they know anything about Israel. I doubt very many of them know anything about it or about the Palestinians. But it does show the kind of strength of identity politics, I think. On this question of finance, which is, again is, is kind of thrown up all the time, is a pretty red herring. It is true that Israel has allowed Qatar, uh, which is the main fund of Hamas, to send funds into Gaza. Uh, and what Israel was doing there was to try to prop up, uh, to stop Gaza collapsing completely. Uh, so in that, to that degree, uh, collaborating with Hamas. But to me, that shows the opposite. That shows that in that context, both Hamas and Israel were actually collaborating against Palestinian uh, self-determination. It just it reinforces how reactionary uh, Hamas is and how it doesn't represent the Palestinians. So it, it, to me, it illustrates the exact opposite point that people generally make from it. And of course, Israel okay. has learned from its mistakes now not to uh, collaborate with Hamas. It was also, from an Israeli perspective, a big mistake. Just finally, I think it's a complete mistake to have any kind of moral equivalence between what Israel is doing in Gaza uh, and uh, what, what what Hamas did. Just to, just to quote what I said at the beginning, which is completely mainstream Hamas doctrine, we will repeat the October 7th attack time and again until Israel is annihilated. We are victims. Everything we do is justified. So Hamas, time and time again, Yes, yeah. its goal is to annihilate Jews. Hezbollah, which is the Lebanese terrorist group in the north of Israel, one of their leaders said that he wanted to do dozens of times as much damage as Hamas did in its attack. Israel is also facing attacks from the Houthis in Yemen, who are firing missiles at Israel. So Israel is facing an existential threat. Okay. It has several fronts trying to kill its citizens. And under that context, there is no moral equivalent. What okay. would you do? If someone was trying to kill your family, what would you do? You okay, let's leave it there, Daniel. Defend yourself, I would argue. Cheers. Uh, Sabina, a quick thought. Well, I was also going to pick up the person who said um, that Israel was held up to a higher standard because the other thing um, he said, you said was that it was an uh, immensely privileged situation. Now, I've never actually seen Israel as being in a particularly privileged situation. It's always been a country which is surrounded by uh, states which have sworn to push it back into the sea. Uh, it had a war declared against it on the day of its founding. Um, it's always constantly had to defend itself. But there is something interesting in this thing about privileged situation, because it reminds me a little bit of the talk of white privilege, you know, saying what, what you're getting at is that it has a higher living standard and it's tried to protect it. It's uh, it's closed its borders and so on and so forth. And I think that's, uh, you know, the, the fact that you have to apologize for that and say that there's something wrong, you know, like almost like a self-deprecating talk of white privilege. I think I think shows there's something completely wrong in this discussion of accusing Israel for doing things any any decent state would do and, and, and should be proud of. And I was going to pick up on that point Yasha made uh, or Yasha Kriegler about the um, we have to watch out where the criticism comes from. I think what you're trying to say is that if you've got Palestinians who've suffered under Israel and so on, you might you might excuse them but i think if people are at the forefront of the struggle and are really really in, in, in trouble i think it's even more important for them to be absolutely clear against who they're fighting and that they, if they're siding themselves with an organization which has come out of the muslim brotherhood they're making brave grave mistakes and you can see it now um, in in gaza it might be okay for young trendy young people to say oh you know we're on the side of palestine without any consequences and saying you know oh and hamas is a liberation organization because they know it means nothing to them but for people who are really in that situation it means a lot and that's why i think you need to be especially clear and that's why i think the slogan free um gaza from hamas is actually very very valuable okay there's the, we'll try and take a few people who haven't spoken before and then the panel will probably only get a minute or 30 seconds to sum up at the end so someone who's down as amir pass or uh, I, anyway, yeah, go ahead. It's uh, great to see a bunch of uh, faces from Battle of Ideas again. Um, 
I uh, I wanted to initially echo what I said at the battle of ideas, but I, after the admin person spoke, I felt I had to recount um, the all the only question that kind of turned me away from my anti-Semitism to being a pro-Israeli. Uh, uh, I'm definitely pro-Jewish. Is this which Sam Harris asked? He's asked. What would either side do if they had all the power? Well, we know what Israel would do because Israel does have all the power. It's a nuclear power. What do they do? They provide medicine, they provide infrastructure, they provide healthcare to the Palestinians. What would Hamas do if they had all the power? Well, they tell us loud and clear on a daily basis, Israel could wipe out the Gaza before breakfast if it wanted to, but it does everything in its power to prevent it. That's the difference here. And that's something that I would suggest this been mentioned. What about the youth? What about the uh, younger people? Well, I was one of those younger people. And that one question kind of led me down the path of changing my ways. I also had just one very quick question. Can we just leave it there? Sorry, is we're really going to have to get on. That was a great point. Very well made. Uh, we'll come to the next person who's James. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Go Yes, go ahead. Yeah. The most extraordinary thing about the Hamas supporters is their failure to realise what has changed. In the 1970s, Yasser Arafat had many defects, but he was once asked in an interview, are you anti-Semitic? And his reply with a Jewish shrug, I believe, was how can I be against myself? When I was in Lebanon in the early 2000s, I met the Minister for Health in Palestine. I said, my father was 120% Jewish, and I'm 140% in favor of the Palestinians. He said immediately, no contradiction. Something has changed since that era, folks. And the something that's changed is the rise of Iran, the rise of ISIS, the rise of Al-Qaeda, the rise of identity politics, and the general Western self-loathing that it can't even get out of it most elementary financial and economic crises. We need to remember that when 9-11 happened, the only people to support Al-Qaeda on the left were the Workers' Revolutionary Party. In 21 years, now everybody on the left is basically in favor of a ver very similar group to Al-Qaeda. People who talk about Daniel's past need to recognize that in the old days, there was something about the Palestinian struggle which had a general democratic content which we unconditionally support. It included better p p uh, conditions and less oppression for women. Can we really say that of Hamas today? Can we really say that they are for a democratic struggle and that they will, you know, give everybody equal rights? It's an entirely mm -hmm. different situation. And if people don't recognize what's changed, then they are completely frozen in time and impervious to real events. Great, thanks. Okay, next up is Wendy. No, maybe she's gone to she that. I know you're ready and waiting. Hello, hi. I had some crafted points ready then, but the last few presenters have made such brilliant, brilliant points about it, who would... Um, what would either side do if they had all the power? That is that's really sad thinking. But if I could just make the few points I had prepared. Um, I'm glad we live in a you, country. You can make one. One. Okay, so here's the one then. I'm really glad we live in a country where we can do this together tonight and when we can have this range of disagreements about what is going on. Can I make one other? Very quick. The other one that was going to lead to the point about young people, which we've mentioned quite a lot, I think if there is any um, comparison with the 1930s at all, it is the question of the isolation of people. And in spite of all the social media that young people have, um, I don't know if we can imagine what being a 12 or 13 year old is when you style into TikTok at the moment. I don't know if you see what some of these kids are exposed to at the moment. And I think there is a process, a deliberate process of brutalization of those young people that's going on at the moment, which could only, at the at the best, be very confusing. That's my only other point. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll come back. I'll come back now to, uh, I think it's Alka, actually, who's behind Wendy's camera. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. 
You're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So we're at the end of the Cold War, all the geopolitical relationships established there, the end of the organized working class in, the, in Western nations, the collapse of the hollowing out of social democracy and the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. So, you know, anyone that thinks you would have the same position as you might have had exactly. you know, is, is, is bonkers. I think the other thing that hasn't been mentioned is the collapse of moral thinking, the inability or the conflation of moral thinking with knowledge. And you see it, you know, increasingly you know, people either think moral thinking is just subjective opinion or it's you or it's a thing that you can come to through knowing more history, knowing more politics. And I think that's a real fallacy. I think, you know, if you you know, the people that have pointed to the uniqueness of October the 7th really need to think about, you know, what what was it? You know, the qualitative difference be, between, you know, to say there's no difference to just take it as a body count thing totally ignores human subjectivity and agency, the intention of the people, what they were hoping to achieve. They might have had geopolitical interests, you know, trying to sort of react against the possible uh, recognition between um, Israel and um, Saudi, for example. But, you know, that even that doesn't explain the intention that, you know, the kind of pure evil of going in and killing, torturing, murdering people just because of who they are and they have the you know non-combatants just because of who they are so that that is your starting point right you don't really need that you don't need to i mean you do need knowledge later on to justify your point that's true mm. but the you know, i was here too many people i think we've just lost the practice of doing that and when you talk about identity politics we tend to think of campuses and young people but it's broader than that it's my neighbour who, when you know, a woman that's older than me, very nice, lovely, mildly Brit pro patriotic British white woman, who, when I talk to her about the war, says, "You'd have thought, after everything they'd been through, that they would know better." Right? Mm. I mean, what is that if not if not an utter uh, moral paralysis? And I think that's you know, I think it's up to people in Palestine to deal with Hamas, but we have our, a very urgent problem that is related to that here. Okay, great. Okay, I think there were two people left to take. One of them was Dennis Russell. Exactly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, Hannah Nashwari is one of the oldest Palestinian PLO people, one of the oldest hands in the book. Um, I watched her being interviewed by Matt Fry, and Matt Fry said to her, and this is vis-a-vis -vis Anne's Lionel Shriver's kind of um, point. She said, um, Matt Price said to her, what's going to happen when, when Hamas are beaten out of uh, Gaza? And she laughed at his naivety in thinking that um, Hamas could be beaten out of Gaza. She said, don't you understand that Hamas have a military wing, they have a militia, a, a police force, they have a student movement, they have a women's movement, and they have all the funding that they require. And she said the idea that Hamas can be beaten so easily out of Gaza is, is ludicrous. And she kind of uh, sort of laughed wryly and said, perhaps when this is all over, a new generation of people can take us in a different direction. It was a kind of admittance that, you know, the PLO in Gaza are not an, uh, have, have very little authority. And in actual fact, in the in in the UN, the United Nations, Ireland, which has been one of the most sort of vociferous critics of Israel, um, they have stood against the fact that EU funds are paid to the Palestinian Authority, and the Palestinian Authority pay a stipend to all the families of the of the Hamas prisoners that are in Israeli jails, and so that indicates that. You know, the, the Palestinian Authority are much closer to Hamas than pe people actually think. And just finally, on the Islamophobia thing, um, on why people, young people are so pro-Hamas um, or pro-Palestine, it's associated with Islamophobia. Isn't it? Kamala Harris came out tonight and said America is paying particular attention to combating hate crime, the hate crime of Islamophobia. With young girls being uh, abused and fed drugs and alcohol in Rotherham and other parts of the United Kingdom by Muslim men. It's clear that 
officials in the civil in 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 the social services in the police and politicians so afraid of islamophobia ignored all this and that's the reason why young people in britain particularly uh, are are so pro the palestinians because they feel it's just islamophobia okay nice okay i said i'd finish with ian fitzsimmons so please go ahead No, maybe yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I just I just tried to unmute myself. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's going back to a point. I think Claire made that point about when she noticed that things have changed a few years ago, and I noticed that it had changed maybe a few years before that. I was at some anti-imperialist meeting thirty-five odd years ago with a, a panel of speakers. One of them was a, a pro-Palestine speaker who happened to be a bloke from London. Uh, and his his main objection was that he didn't want his fellow speakers to have an alcoholic drink on the table. One of the guys had a pint of Guinness on the table, and he was more concerned about that rather than raising his point about anti-imperialism and all the rest of it. Uh, and that was that. Uh, somebody mentioned there was a turning point in this whole dialogue about Palestine and stuff. And that's you know, at least thirty five years ago where it was. Hold on a minute. It's not about Palestine. It's not about self determination. It's not about the rights of nations to self determination. It's more about a, a, a totally new narrative. And we've sort of allowed that to happen. We've allowed that. Thankfully, the, the speaker said, No, I'm going to drink my pint of Guinness and you can stick up your ass. It was, it was that. And it was really, you know, in my naive political state, it was holding them. And what's going on here? What's happened to the the discussion about the rights of nations. And I've had to reread re re that book a few times over the last few years about Brexit, Ukraine. I've had to reevaluate what my stance is on nations. And I think we've become sidetracked with this, with the disgusting attack on Israel on the 7th. We've tried to analyse and dissect what's right and what's wrong about all oh, the oppressors and the colonisers. And we've lost sight of what the evil is. And even this discussion, I think, this is this discussion is about anti-Semitism today, and people are talking about Palestine and this and that. But this is meant to be about anti-Semitism and how this hatred that's allowed to fester for, as I mentioned like when I first spoke, I don't know, an hour ago, about I saw this 40 years ago when I was growing up in Hackney. I've experienced it. I was part of it. I was coming out with anti-Jewish shit when I was young. Yeah, okay. And, let's, and let's it's, wrap still, it up there. It's, it's still happening, and we're getting sidetracked by talking about Palestine. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, so there's way too much to sum up and all the rest of it. Usual disclaimers apply, but if I just get one quick kind of final thought from each of the panellists to end on and to say that uh, oh, this has been a, a useful chance to have this discussion and something that we at the academy of ideas will do further and a few more things on that after our speakers but um uh in the order we started so i, I don't know daniel just one thing to leave us with well i just wanted to check with the commercial really so uh I i'm going to investigate this whole relationship between islamism and identity politics in my radicalism of fools website radicalism of fools.com so subscribe to that take out paid subscription if you want even better uh, so I'll talk about things there. And just very finally, what Mark said early on, the kind of Our Fight initiative, which is to get people, including non-Jews, to defend Jews against anti-Semitism. I think that's really, really important because I think in, in and of itself, it's very important to defend Jews against anti-Semitism. But it's also part of a broader struggle for Western civilization and modernity. And I think, think people should really, really support that. Great. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Uh, Laura, a final thought. Yes, um, I want to summarise by returning to Elka's point about morality, because I did talk about morals in my opening comments, and I think it's the most important point to come back to. There are four foundational questions we could have talked about tonight. The first one is, does the state of Israel has a right to exist? What we've learned really recently is a lot of people think no, and that has moral and multiple dimensions. But here's the, here's the second foundational question. I won't go into the other two. Can you condemn terrorism unequivocally? Do you know when you have looked into the face of evil? After the 7th of October, I could barely sleep for a week because we did see the face of evil unmasked. 
you do not need to contextualize or relativize what happened on that day. It was uh, it was depraved. And so we do need to come back to our morals, but there is a lot of fake morality. There's immorality. We just mentioned Kamala Harris. Her comments about Islamophobia are supposed to look moral, but they are anything but. It's this culturally mediated hypothesis of a dominant narrative that everyone's supposed to get on board with. This is a cloak of morality, but it's not real. We know that right now the problem in this country is not Islamophobia. It's anti-Semitism, which, which is what tonight was about. So... Yeah, it's about coming back to your morals. That's that's the most important thing to take from this. You should know evil when you see it's done and you should show solidarity with the people that are living under the threat of evil. And that's the most important thing. Uh, so to that end, sign the October Declaration, please. Great. Thanks a lot, Laura. And Sabina, final word. Yeah, I mean, uh, the longer I, I deal with this problem, I, I realise it's got less to do with Israel and Jews and much more to do with our society and um, problems which have built up over the years and the kind of confusion, the moral confusion, the ideologies which have gone astray. The, with, they've been mentioned, uh, multiculturalism, identity politics. And I fear that what the, the reactions and the cowardice, which I mentioned at the beginning and some of the points which were so well made in the discussion today by others, I think I fear that we're only seeing the beginning. I think this is going to be a very, very long struggle, which is going to go right to the core of our own societies in the West. And I wanted to also end by thanking Laura for the October Declaration. And I've tried to find, I've really Googled, I've contacted people to see if there's anything like that in Germany. Unfortunately, there isn't. I've now translated your declaration into German. Um, I've adapted it a little bit to our situation. And I want to ask permission. I don't know who I can ask whether I can use it, because I have a few people I want to contact and I'd like to try and get it going in Germany as well, because I just think it's so important. Thank you. Yes, yes, please. Um, Jacob, yeah. I think we're connected on email, of course. Yeah, the, 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 the two Great of you idea. can take that up. And there's also various uh, discussion in the comments about how to take this uh, further. Uh, the, the first thing you can do is watch out for further debates or interventions from us at the Academy of Ideas. So make sure you're subscribed to our Substack, which is clairefox.substack.com. Uh, follow us on Twitter, at Acad of Ideas, uh, with at Acad of Ideas in most places, Facebook, Instagram, and such like. Um, you can go to our website. Uh, generally speaking, please stay in touch. If you'd love to make a donation, if you've enjoyed this event, we'd greatly appreciate it. We The Academy of Ideas runs on a shoestring, and we've just had a very big and very exhausting festival. So we, if, if you'd like to help support us, we'd very much appreciate that. Um, I also urge that you go over to the Battle of Ideas Festival website where you can find out more about our speakers. Uh, but for now, can we join? Uh, can you join me in just thanking and uh, all the speakers and also everyone who contributed to the discussion? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent discussion, everyone. Thanks.